Yeah, so this is a continuation of what we went through last week. And as Jeff was saying, we never actually got to the voting across <laughs> Coracle columns, but this is part of my, um, you know, fear, uh, not fear, but, you know, issue that in, in talking about this, there's so many other things that are involved when we talk about what's going on within a cortical column. It's sometimes hard to get one thing across without describing, you know, a lot of the other stuff. And I think we had a pretty good discussion last week uh, on some of that. And people were very willing to ask dumb questions and stuff. And I hope, uh, keep please do that because it was clear that there's a lot of different things that, you know, Jeff and I and Marcus and others kind of take for granted, but, um, you know, others may not uh, know that stuff. So, you know, we have 16 years of <laughs> history here working together. So it's a lot of stuff. Um, okay. Uh, so this is, again, a review of this paper that we published back in 2017. Um, and this paper described uh, voting across cortical columns and also how a single cortical column uh, can recognize objects. So the, if you remember, this was a, there were two different situations here. We had this thought experiment where you stick your hand in a box and you're trying to figure out what's inside that box. And the first situation is you're trying to recognize the object with a single figure this is by moving that finger around. And then the second task is recognize the object with multiple fingers where, you know, let's say you stick your whole hand in and you can grasp the entire object um, and so on. So um, we went through kind of the basic single cortical column model. Um, I think so you have sensory input. You know, we talked about the sequence memory where you have sensory input coming in and you have the recurrent connections on the distal basal dendrites, which act as predictions for the for our cells. Um, and then say, well, you could take the exact same model by putting in a location uh, signal or a motor driven uh, signal that can act as context for the sensor, for the sensory input. And that way you can represent sensory features at specific locations. And essentially it's the exact same code base uh, that's used for the sequence memory. And that means it's the exact same neuron model that's used uh, to do sensory motor sequences. And so the basic hypothesis of the paper was that by adding this location signal, um, you could have a layer of cells that can predict its input as the sensor is moving around. And in this paper, we didn't actually describe specifically what the location signal might be. We did the, the, you know, we've talked about that a lot later and then the Columns Plus paper uh, uh, you know, proposes grid cells as a mechanism for it. But for the purpose of this paper, you can just think of this as just an SDR that represents the allocentric location of the sensor on the object. That is something like a, uh, just a coordinate that's representing um, uh, either the, the location of the feature in the reference frame of the object itself. So the basic network had this sequence memory-like structure below here. And as you're moving, you get different uh, you know, look, look, uh, features at different locations that end up being activated here. The second layer is an, an object layer. Or that This is a layer that pulls over uh, different sensory inputs that belong to a feature. And it, basically, this layer is a lot more stable than the one below. This is one, the one below is changing with every movement. And the one on top is uh, stable uh, as long as you're sensing a particular object. Um, we walked through this example, which I won't go through, but I'll, I'll remind everyone of this and then we'll do the multi-column version of this. Okay, so here the finger is about to sense this object. It doesn't yet know what it is. Um, and as it starts to move towards that feature, uh, we have the predicted, we have a location signal coming in that's gonna predict where on the object's reference frame we're gonna touch. So based on this, this is a context signal, you'll get a bunch of predictions that's showing up in this temporal memory layer, uh, the input layer. And then when you actually touch the object, you get the actual features coming in. Um, it's going to overlap with some of the predicted features and you'll get these, um, these purple squares here represent cells that were correctly predicted when you got the sensory input coming in. That information then is sent to the output layer and you will get, because this layer has pooled over all the possible objects, you're going to get 
a set of cells becoming active that correspond to all the objects that are consistent with this particular sensory input at, at this particular relative location on the Earth. So you get a, a bunch of cells. Here you get a union of SDRs. And let's say it's representing at this point, three possible objects. This tennis ball, this Coke can, and this coffee cup are all consistent. This layer could have learned dozens or hundreds of objects, but these are the only three that are consistent with this sensory input at this location. And now you're moving to the next location. Um, as Just as you're moving, you, you have a different predicted location that in turn is going to cause predictions in the sensory layer here. Um, you get the actual sensory input. It's going to be consistent with some subset of it. Now this, this set of active cells then propagates to the output layer. And what's going to happen now is each of these cells in the output layer, they're getting lateral support from other cells that represent the same object that it represents. So it's getting lateral support. And now when the input comes in, the cells that have both lateral support and feed forward input are gonna be the ones that are most strongly activated. And those are the ones that are gonna win in the winner take all year. Okay, so that's the essence of the algorithm that's winnowing down on the set of hypotheses. So based on this feature, now you can rule out the tennis ball, uh, but, you, but both the can and the coffee cup are still consistent. And then finally, as soon as you move to the handle here, exact same thing happens again, uh, the sensory, feature that's at these locations is sent up and now only the coffee cup is consistent with the past input uh, as well as the current feed forward input that's coming in. Okay, and again, within this cell, uh, within this layer are all these cells that are getting lateral support from the other cells that represent the same object. Um, and that's, those cells are seen to be more persistent. And then when they get feed forward input the ones that have the strongest input are the ones that, that stay, stay on. You know? Okay, so essentially you have a, a union of hypotheses that are possible and then you narrow that down as you get additional sensory input. So it is integrating evidence over time. Okay. Any questions? Um, Should have been a review, but uh, please, please ask questions. Yeah, I can kick off our first stupid question of the day here. Um, you said uh, you can think of the location signal as an SDR. And I know that's maybe still an area of research, but how should I think of that? Like when I think of an SDR, I think of a population of neurons. And what's the coupling then between that population of neurons and the neurons receiving the location signal here? Do they all get the same you know, input or is it distributed, you know, Many pop, many neurons over here. It's many neurons over here. Does that question make sense? Yeah. So this path, this location signal here, is really a pathway, and so you might have, let's say, a couple of thousand cells here. Some sparse subset of this is active, um, and all of the neurons in this input layer have access to this set of inputs. And through learning, what's going to happen is that. The, the ones that, um, just like in the, in the temporal memory, the cells are going to make connections to the active location inputs as you get sensory input. So when you get, during learning, what will happen is you get sensory input. Nothing is predicted at that point because you're, you're learning. Um, you'll pick some winner cell in these mini columns. That winner cell is then going to learn some, is going to sample from the, active cells in the location pathway. I think that's important. It doesn't have to connect to all of them. Just it doesn't have to connect to all of them. It's just some subsample. Yeah. And the SDR math you know, shows why that's possible. Um, and then what happens is the next time you get that exact same location signal, now you do have a prediction because some dendritic segment is gonna recognize that pattern. And so you'll get a prediction on those cells. So when the feature does come in that particular cell is going to win. So and, should I think of it as each, each neuron receiving a location signal is coupled to a, a small subset of neurons generating or participating in the location signal? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. They, each, yeah, each neuron doesn't receive the location signal. I mean, you can just imagine physically 
the location signal for the bunch of axons are just sort of streaming through these neurons. And they don't, not, not, they don't make connections or even potential connections to all the neurons. So the, the, each neuron in the layer just has to figure out what it can connect to. Um, and there's a, there's a whole set of neuroscience behind that. Um, so it's not like every cell's getting this stuff. It's like the, in, the, in the biology, they're trying to make connections to a subset that works for them and not all the connections can be made. In our software, you can do anything you want. You can have every neuron be able to connect to every input axon that's active. Um, but in biology, there's a physical constraint to this because not every axon can reach every neuron at the right place. Perfect. So this would be a dynamic sparse algorithm in some of the terminology we've been using more recently in terms of the connectivity. Perfect. So, so in the math, is there <clears throat> some sense of, uh, if it doesn't connect to all of them, what a workable subset might be? Yeah, yeah, we can, we can uh, quantify that pretty well. So um, it you. actually lines up really, really well with the biology. So if yeah. you have, you know, a couple of thousand you know, if this dimensionality, the dimensionality of this vector is about a couple of thousand, you can connect to something like, you know, 20 of them subsampled. And let's say, let's say 40 are active at a time. You can subsample half of them, connect to 20, uh, and it would be just fine. But that's if they're localized on one particular section of the dendrite, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. It, it's go, you know, going back to the dendritic segment stuff, it'll be those 20 will connect to one dendritic segment. One I of think the... pretty much, you know, it's the, that 20 number is, it's kind of works for any reasonably large uh, number of axons with as long as they're sparse. I mean, you can have 50,000 axons coming in and if it's a sparse activation, you'll still 20 will work. <laughs> um, even if even if a thousand neurons are active, 20 would work um, as long as it's sparse. And as long as there's enough, uh, it's pretty simple to be. Yeah, it's very simple to go through it, and we could do that at another meeting, maybe. And, but and, you know, let's say you have twenty connections, and only half of them actually have to be active in order to do the threshold in in the in a real dendritic segment. So it's incredibly sparse. So Subutai had a whole page on this math in this paper, the two thousand. I think it was in that paper, um, just describing this and lining it up. And you haven't mentioned it, but as he said, it's really it's really nice because in the biology, it's it's somewhere around you know fifteen to 30, 20, you know synapses are sufficient or typically can be formed. Um, so it's, here's what it is on a dendritic segment, up to forty synapses can integrate at once. So that's kind of your limit. You can't really form more connections at once. Recognize a pattern forty, and and the and you can form a dendritic spike with as few as ten or fifteen synapses active depending on various things. So you're in that range there. Do, do, we, do we have some notion? Is, there's, is there some homeostatic principle that, uh, you know, focuses around 20, you know, 10 is too uh, small, 40 it's, it's, is too much? Well, as we said, mathematically, Subutai showed that. 40 is not too right, much. But there's not, there's biologically, about how does it find that? Uh, it just comes out, well, it just is. I mean, so math says it has to be in this, the math says this sufficiently small range is good enough. And, and then empirically, that's what's observed because of the, the, um, the electrical ch chemical properties of a dendritic segment. So, you know, there's no universal principle of the, that says biology has to do this. It's just, it matches what the theory says. And, and the biology is just because you have these little leaky integrators and you, the synapses have to be close enough so that they, they multiply as opposed to being, if they're further apart on the dendrite. It, if you think of it this way, a, a, a dendrite can have about one synapse per micron. So if you start getting more synapses, the dendritic segment has to be longer, the integration zone has to be longer. And once it gets longer, then they don't integrate anymore, they're too far away. <laughs> so, so it's kind of, I don't know, that's what it is. So I, I so kind of also self like to think that in that sense. Yeah, I also think there's potentially evolutionary pressure to get to as small a number as possible without losing accuracy, because uh, there are metabolic costs to having too many synapses and large dendrites and all that. Yeah. And so it's not surprising to me, in some sense, that evolution would go yeah. towards sort of a really minimal 
system as long as he's still accurate enough. Yeah, no, I, so, I, I, I agree. I, I was just kind of curious what biological mechanism actually enforces that. Well, I mean, the biological yes, mechanism is, is the fact that when two synapses get more than 40 microns apart, they really can't interface, they can't interface with each other. They can't, okay. you know, they can't interact. So within 40 microns, you can say, hey, they're all going to impact one another. But if you go beyond that, it's too far away. And they, they just can't. Yeah. They can't. And there are some homeostatic learning mechanisms. And I think we covered that in the dendrites talk is, you know, there you if a synapse is not contributing, um, it gets the potential, you know, it right. gets uh, uh, depressed and then eventually dropped. And so okay. there's stuff like I, that. I, th I think I have, the, uh, I have the answer. It's it's just basically the the um, electrical properties of, of, of the dendrite causes these things to form uh, clusters because if they don't work beyond a certain distance, then they self-isolate. Okay, I got it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, now we can finally move to actual voting. <laughs> so we just went through the single column version of, of uh, the algorithm this two layer algorithm. And now imagine there's multiple cortical columns. So here we're showing three cortical columns. Each cortical column is getting a, a completely different sensory input coming in, let's say these three fingers. Um, and then each cortical column is doing uh, something similar to what I, I just mentioned there. Each one is getting a location that's on the object. Now the key thing here is that each cortical column is getting a different location signal corresponding to the sensory input that it's responsible for. So depending on where this finger ends up on the coffee cup, um, you'll get a, is that the index finger? Yeah, index finger. <laughs> um, then you would get the location of the index finger on the coffee cup. Same thing for the ring finger. Which one's the, this one's the uh, ring finger. Ring, ring. I don't know what this one is. Middle um, finger. This is the root finger. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Middle finger. Yeah, so you get three different location signals coming in okay. and they're they're in theory in principle they're completely independent in in the case of a hand there's some constraints between them but think of it as being completely independent locations coming in um, and then the big uh, other difference is now you have these long range lateral connections that cut across the cortical columns um, these are um, also going on the distal basal dendritic segments of these cells um, and the way these long range signals work is exactly the same as what I described previously for within a single column, what's going on with the lateral connections. Um, but conceptually what's happening is that each, each column is getting uh, votes from its neighbors as to what, uh, for each of the hypotheses that are consistent with the sensory inputs that column one has seen, it's going to, send those signals to column two. Column two is also gonna get all of the hypotheses that are consistent with what column three has seen so far. It's gonna get that transmitted uh, here through these long range connections. And essentially the cells that have the most votes for specific objects, those are the ones that are gonna be persistent on there, okay? So now it's not just the information it's received over time, it's also the in information it's getting currently from uh, the lateral, co the columns that are on each side of it. Here. Um, and just as a reminder, each column here has partial knowledge of the object because it's just getting a s small part of the overall sensory inputs that, that the animal is getting. Um, the long range connections allow the columns to vote. And then of course now inference is gonna be much faster with multiple columns. So now we can do this exact same experiment again, except with three fingers. So you're grasping the coffee cup with three fingers. And this is animation is again, thanks to uh, Lewis. Uh, so here's, here's a 3D hand grasping, uh, you know, three points on the, on the cup. Uh, and each one of them is gonna get a location signal coming in that's gonna cause predictions in, in each of those cortical columns. Each one's then gonna get sensory input that's coming in. So specific sets of uh, cells here are gonna become active based on the prediction. And then 
those uh, are going to get sent to the output layer here. And now each cortical column at this point in time is going to have a different set of hypotheses depending on what it's sense. So this column one, um, its input is consistent with either a tennis ball or a coffee cup. Column two, it's consistent with the soda can and the coffee cup and same thing with the column three. But if you notice, there's only one object that's actually consistent with all three um, inputs coming in at all three columns. So now you get the voting thing happens. Um, and then what will happen is each particle column is gonna get input from its neighbors and it's going to win out, the ones that are gonna win out are the ones that are consistent with all of the evidence, the current dates. In this case, in one grasp, it can recognize the object. In, uh, uniquely, even though no single cortical column here has enough information to uniquely determine the object. Okay. Is that clear? Any questions? That is uh, essentially the voting algorithm. Yeah, yeah I, I hope it's not a stupid question, but- It's, um, uh, it's okay if it is. <laughs> <laughs> How does this uh, voting signal look like? Is it the sparse representation of the object or is it some kind of ID of the object or, or what, what's it, what is the voting signal? The voting signal is literally all of the cells that are active in each cortical column. Every cell here is transmitting, has axons that go laterally. Okay, so there's so. kind of like dense connect, or the fu fully connected between them? No, 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 not doesn't... fully connected. They're just axons that are going across, just like every other layer here. They're just axons that are going across or dendrites that are going across. And you each dendrite will make connections to the specific set of inputs that are consistent with you know, it's, okay. it's experienced so, through heavy so here, So here's something that's really interesting about this. If you just think about one column, there has to be sufficient connectivity within one column so that that column on its own can eliminate possibilities when it's, if it's acting as a single finger, something like that. So there has to be a reasonable amount of voting going on within a single column. But between columns, it can be very, very sparse. So in this case, we show three columns in reality, in the brain, there might be many thousands or tens of thousands of columns that are voting together, all the columns in the visual system or all the columns in the somatosensory system and so on, potentially voting to each other, with each other, including columns from the left hand and the right hand. So, but those connections can be extremely sparse. Um, you can think of it this way. I, imagine you're just one column and I want this, this uh, I need to have this voting mechanism work. Well. The cells in my one column, say column two here, they have to form enough connections with the other cells in column two so that I have the context so I could resolve my, my ambiguity. But in terms of all the other columns that I might be voting with, this may sound st striking, but if all the other columns are working on the same object, I only have to make 40 connections to, to all the other columns total. Uh, it, it can be really smart. I can make one connection to column one, one connection to column 46, one connection to column 2000 and so on, and it still works. <laughs> um, it, you, it, it depends on how many other columns are out there that are voting on the same thing. Um, all that matters is that I'm able to sample a, you know, a, let's say 20 synapses from all the other cells that might be active someplace um, that are part of this representation and it'll work. And if the different columns do this randomly, you can have a very, very sparse connectivity. And because that's actually what we see. We don't see, we see a lot of axons. Let's say this is in layer two, three. We see a lot of axons going long distances in the cortex in layer two, three. Uh, they can be across to the other side of the brain. We can see connections from the left hand to the right hand. You see those, you see them from primary visual cortex to primary auditory cortex. But these tend to be very sparse. It's not like this, you know, there's a lot of axons, but the actual, the number of connections I might make between one column in the visual cortex and one column in the auditory cortex could be very, very small. And um, it still works. So I'm not, I don't know how to convince you of that if it's not obvious, <laughs> but it's, um, it's, a, it's really surprising. Um, but it, that's all it requires. Yeah, yeah, that so, makes makes a lot of things clearer, definitely. I, I think it also kind of answers my next question of 
who counts the vote. So if I understand you right, it's basically there's no higher level process that then counts the vote, but it's more all the neurons that kind of recognize cups, looks at its connections and then says, okay, I think it might be a cup or a ball, but all these other guys say it's it's a cup. So I'm going to change my mind now and also say it's definitely yeah. cup. And yeah, then, that's part of the exactly that's part of the trick is you know there's no homunculus or some external process it's just these neurons so it has to happen at the level of the neuron um, and so the neurons are getting you know all these connections from other uh, you know cortical columns and also from other cells within the same column and whichever ones has the most votes uh, those are the ones that are going to respond strongly and will inhibit naturally inhibit the other ones so it's yeah, all no one, these local unsupervised processes that are going on. Yeah, no one's in charge. Just like no one was in charge in a single column. It seems I made the point that what's going on in a single column is the same algorithm that's going on across between columns. And that's absolutely true. So within a single column, nobody has to tell it. It's just that there's a, there's a, there's a competitive algorithm going on. And, and whoever gets support from bottoms up in context, is, those are the ones that are going to stay active. And if you didn't get those two supports, you're just, you're going to lose out. And then it'll naturally winnow down to the right answer. Um, if not immediately, through then through multiple sensations. And all we're doing when you do multiple columns is you're basically extending the size of the, the object layer. You're just making the object layer conceptually much, much larger, but you can, any cell can still settle down if it just, it needs to get lateral support and feed forward support and then it's good. So, so and it's very question. close to what's happening in here too. If you look at the sensory input, it, th those are also pyramidal neurons with active dendritic segments. And the ones that have support, in this case, from a location signal, when that's the context, the ones that have the support from location signal are the ones that are gonna win out, whereas the other ones will not. So that's how you get these unique kind of cells becoming active. So what's going on in this layer below is very, very close to what's going on here. So, so I, have a, I have a question about the temporal component. So if I grasp, I can get a certain degree of synchrony. If I go one, two, three, I still am able to recognize it. So what is, I, I don't want necessarily, um, the thing fires, sends a single spike, and I'm looking for them all kind of coordinating. What's the integrative mechanism that allows me to uh, not miss spikes, you know, coming you know, at slightly different times uh, and not necessarily building up a, a coherent uh, pattern on uh, whatever you're saying. You're saying, you're out. saying there's a, the, the output layer is stable and the input layer is changing. And then how do we, how does it know, how does it integrate over time? How no, I think he's output? asking a more precise question, um, which is actually, I think a very good question. If you look at, I, assuming I got your question correct, uh, maybe it's not the okay, same. We'll but go with it. If you look at this act, if you if you look at a single active dendritic segment, in order for it to fire, all of the synapses have to become active within a few milliseconds of each other, and so that means all of the output from the other cortical column has to be arriving within a few milliseconds if it's going to initiate a dendritic spike. And so, how is that synchronization happening? Is that kind of the essence of your question? It's either how is it synchronizing or is there something which uh, there's a time constant which, which, which holds the signal for some period of time so that the voting can actually occur over a meaningful time interval. I don't know which of the two mechanisms applies. Uh, yeah, I know, but dendritic segments, you have to have these spikes within a few milliseconds uh, of each other. And there are mechanisms we, which we didn't discuss here for, synchronizing uh, groups yeah. of cells. We have these oscillations and stuff. And, and you know, we speculate in the past, that one of the reasons to have that is to, so you can have these like really tight synchrony across. Uh, but I would say, cells. I, I would say overall, we don't know the answer to that question, Kevin, which is it, or if it's both. I mean, the, there's evidence that Subutai said that, hey, you know, these, these, ac these action potentials have to arrive on a dendrite pretty close together in time. Um, but I'm not sure that we know the answer. Uh, there is a lot of stuff that's unknown here. I think we can say that this voting mechanism, I, I feel comfortable saying this voting mechanism is happening in the brain. This is very, very clear. 
but there's a lot of details about it that we're, you know, we, we can only read so much in the empirical literature um, and you, you can't trust everything and there's some conflicting things. And there's sometimes these systems seem to be persistent and sometimes they don't. And so I, I get uncomfortable saying, I know the answer to this question. I don't. And I, I, I think, but I'm comfortable saying that it's, it's, it works <laughs> somehow. Um, yeah. So I was, I was, you know, uh, I earlier, um, uh, based upon, uh, the last, uh, uh, research meeting uh, that we had on this thing, I asked uh, Subutai, what, what's the conditions under which a spike train is, is generated? And so that's another way of, if you, if you can't make it, you know, you know, if, if you want to create a window in which, you know, there's a greater chance of synchron uh, overlap between things, you might generate a spike train. So at least, you know, there's well, a higher I think, probability. I think it's more like, as soon as I said, that the spikes are arriving uh, synchronized with various rhythms. Right. I, I'm just saying there's 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 three mechanisms. Either it's a sample and hold, it's a continuous uh, output uh, for over range, or you manage to precisely synchronize things so that they can actually uh, integrate over a very yeah. fine time. I, 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 doubt, I doubt it's going to be the continuous firing one. The, the evidence we have wouldn't, would suggest that's the least likely one. Um, the other two are more likely. Yeah, I mean, there there are good reasons for for. And we for do, and we that. do know that we do know the synchrony thing. You know, the research that's been done on grid cells, for example, is really really fascinating um, because it shows in the grid cell mechanisms not only is it is it timed with the end of, you know with the rhythm of a of the of a of a you know the timed with let's say a, a theta rhythm, but it's it's timed with specific phase of the theta rhythm like you know the different part. and so there's it's even it's more precise than just you know oh on the peak of the theta rhythm no it's it's like oh at the 90 degrees of the theta rhythm everything um right. so uh we now we know that neurons have this ability to be very precise timing relative to rhythms and um so that that's a fact and um, whether they're doing that everywhere is an interesting question. We don't know, but I'm so I'm I'm guessing it's going to be you know, neurons. The terms of neural mechanisms we have are really not very blunt. They're tend to be very precise, and people think of them as blunt, but they're not. Yeah, yeah. And, and my conjecture was, is that that precise timing allows active dendrites to work. <laughs> yeah. It's one and at the same time, I was, I was I was going to say if if you have the precise timing, then you can uh, react to a different stimuli more quickly rather than ha they're having a, a lag for that. So I, I yeah. could I could see that. There's also what there's you're also saying, are you saying with the phase it, it provides you a vernier mechanism to actually precisely yeah. synchronize things? Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying that's happening here. I'm just saying we know that neurons are capable of that. And um, also, there's evidence that there's sort of a memory trace for individual synapses um, that. Uh, that one individual synapse becomes active, um, the dendrite knows it happened for a while. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of stuff going on do we, you know, that could answer this question. Yeah, uh, okay. Very brief question. Um, this might be kind of vague, but uh, I just wanted to know what are the general rules for how those lateral connections are kind of formed? Um, is that beyond the scope of, of this model, or is that something it's, that's... It's not beyond the scope of the biology understanding. It, it's, it's not something we modeled when we, you know, there was a simulation we ran with this paper, but the simulation didn't really include that. The way these things... So we had tend, learning, no, we had learning. Yeah, but, but, but let me, I'll go through some of the learning rules that we didn't have. So again, there's this very well-known thing that when you're at birth, there's a profusion, over profusion of connections, more, axons and more synapses than you're going to use and they get pruned back and presumably what's going on there is that the brain doesn't know in the beginning like which areas can 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 cooperate with each other right you know given the the, the world and so it forms all these connections which get lost and then later on you won't be able to form them very easily so there's a pruning thing we didn't model that um, also their individual axons and dendrites are always growing. They're, they're like little, little worms that are sort of sticking their nose out in different places and trying to form new connections and retracting if they don't find them. And so there's all this kind of growth that goes on. We modeled that in a very simple way. We just said, oh, well, we'll just form connections when we need them. 
and we won't we don't have to worry about the physical constraints of the neural tissue um so we do model forming a new synapses but we didn't have to model these other things that are actually going on in the real brain um there's no point in modeling them did were you going to say something different to um you know, I can talk about the specific learning rules that we did implement because those are all unsupervised uh, learning rules, you know, very similar to the temporal memory one where, and what we talked about with dendrites last time. Um, I don't know if that would be helpful or not, but it, it doesn't model the stuff you just talked about, Jeff, of the initial profusion of growth and things like that. Yeah. But uh, we did have a very simple set of learning rules for each neuron and how it made connections to the, to the active cells. Yeah, I think those are, you said those were done randomly, right? And over time, um, if we if we take the well, expectation. Well, uh, the learning rules are not random and the connections that are made are not, are not random, uh, but they subsample from the set of active cells that are there. So the set of active cells is not random, but then we take a random subsample of that. Does that make so sense? I, I think I meant like, um, it might start off randomly, but over time, the appropriate synapses get strengthened and the appropriate ones also get, I guess. No, weaker. no, 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 Is no, no. Different? Yeah, it's different. It's not like we're setting, well, it's not like a deep learning system where you set up a random set of connections and then through back propagation, you know, uh, tune each weight until you get to a final set. It's very, very fast. It's um, when a cell becomes active, it looks around to see what other cells are active nearby or whether the axons are active nearby and it proactively forms connections to those. Um, and then over time, if there are some axons that are not correlated with the cell's activity, it's going to drop off. But the initial set of connections are super, it's super fast. Um, there's no, it's not a, it's not a slow tuning of a weight matrix as in backprop. So this kind of, or at least this simple model kind of rules out any possible long distance connections, right? Are, are long distance connections allowed? But the, these are, these voting neurons. These are, are all long, long distance connections. These are long distance connections. My point is if I, if I look at the visual cortex of so the somatocentric cortex uh, or any part of the cortex, you'd see adjacent columns, like, just like shown here, adjacent columns making connections with one another. But actually, where those, you know, but but they'd also go long distances. As I said, you go from the left side of the brain to the right side of the brain. You you go from the somatocentric cortex to visual cortex. There are connections from V1 to S1, which don't make any sense in the traditional hierarchical models. But they make sense here. It's just that those long distance connections, there's lots of them, but they they are still sparse. If you can't have a fully connected network between all columns in the brain, that would be ridiculous. <laughs> so um, these are going to be long distance, but sparse. Thanks. There are lots of long distance connections. Yeah. Uh, Most is, when we say these lateral connections spanning cortical columns, those are long distance connections. You know, it, there's a, this, this, a thing called the white matter in the, in the brain, right? Which is, which is when, when an axon from a, a cell uh, wants to go short distance, maybe a millimeter or two or so on, it can do it right in the cortex. But if it wants to go longer distances, it leaves the cortex and goes into the white matter and enters someplace else. Um, and so most of the volume of the near cortex is in the white matter. And not, it's not most of the connections, but most of the volume. And so those, it, it's interesting, like if you, well, I mentioned this before, but if you, if you cut the corpus callosum, which is the, white matter that's connecting the left side of the brain to the right side of the brain. And so you're literally separating the two halves of the brain. You're basically preventing any long distance connections between the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain. It's surprising at first because it, it doesn't make you disabled in any severe way. It doesn't like, you know, if you, if you cut a computer in half, it's not gonna work, right? Um, but here, it, brains continues to work. But what you find out is that the two sides of the brain are reaching different conclusions or they can reach different conclusions. So if I show, if I, if I take a person who has their brain cut in half and, and, and they grab something with both hands, they'll say, yeah, that's right, I know what that is. 
But if you if you control it so that the left hand and the right hand are actually, could reach different conclusions, they do reach different conclusions. And the left half of the brain may say, oh, this is the coffee cup. And the right half of the brain may say, this is a, you know, a, a tennis ball, whatever. Um, and it's, it, it's just because they can't vote. <laughs> that, that's not the, the real examples, but there are real examples that they've done this, where they, you present something to two sides of the brain and they, they both reach the wrong conclusion that's consistent with the left side input and the right side input, um, but they don't reach the same conclusion. Whereas a normal person who has an intact corpus callosum will reach the same conclusion. They'll say, nope, there's only one answer here and that answer is the coffee cup. Um, so um, those, are, those are long range connections or voting. Not that, that's not only, that's not all the long range connections, but, but a good portion of them are voting just like that. I, I didn't realize they'd done such uh, experiments like that. Well, they've done it in vision where they, yeah. show, where they show something on the left side of the, right, the visual field and the right side of the visual field. Yeah. I, don't know if they, I don't know if they've done the touch. They've done vision. And, um, and, the, and, the, and they'll show that the split brain patients will reach two different conclusions. It's a little tricky because if you just ask them a question, the, vo the, the, the language is only on the left side of the brain. So they can tell you how the left side of the brain made its conclusion. And they can't tell you, they can't ask the right side of the brain, what did you think happened? But they have other ways of discovering that. I don't remember what the experiments are, but they, they, they can like point, uh, point with yeah, the Yeah, they can point, point exactly, right exactly yeah. something exactly like that, right? Point to what you, why, or, you know, point to the reason you made this choice. And the right side will point to one thing and the left side will point to something else. <laughs> the, 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 one, the one I remember, uh, takes advantage of the dimorphism of the brain and they have a black, you have a black box where you reach in at in like have a coffee cup in there, but you can't visually see it. And uh, I forget whether it was the left hand or right hand, but one of them will you grasp it. And you, they ask the person, do you know what it is? Yes. Can you say what it is? And they can't, they can't well, that, put the label. Yeah. To so it. that would be the right side of the brain is grasping the cup and the left side of the brain is, is um, speaking. Although yeah. I think Kevin, you might be talking about like what, where deficiencies, which might be a different where they know the object oh, identity oh. but don't know how to reach to it, or yeah. the, the opposite. I think I think uh, that's a different thing. Maybe you know, th this th this one's uh, they they cognitively could not uh, the connect what the, whatever the recognition that was somatically generated could not cross on over and actually tell them. Uh, to get what the label is. In other words, well, they, well, they somatically yeah, it, it, recognize it was if, familiar. If, if, well, there's two things. If the experiment is specifically isolating inputs from the left side of the, the, the brain to the right side of the brain, or like left hand input from right hand input, left visual field from right visual field, then it could be what you're saying. Uh, Supertai is pointing out the, you know, the, these, these what and where pathways where if you, if you damage one, a person can reach for something, and, but they don't know what it is. Um, they can't, you know, they just don't know what it is. But it's, I don't think yeah, we need to get into this. Is that one I, isolated I, by the corpus callosum? Uh, no, that's a different issue. That's damage to the what and where pathway. I think we're, I don't yeah. want to get off topic here too much because I think we want to focus on the voting mechanism here. And I think it's important to get a sense for this voting mechanism. You know, as Pruzbeck points out very eloquently, I never really realized this, but the, the columns themselves are voting. A single column is voting among its own neurons, but it can also extend its voting to other columns. And um, it's exact, as you point out, it's the exact same mechanism. Nothing is different going on, and it can be extremely sparse and still work um, very, very well. Yeah. Okay. Any other okay. questions on this? Let's see. I don't know what other. What yeah, other I have some tangential questions, but I'm going to leave a moment if anyone else has some. I think we're at the tangential uh, question section. Um, <laughs> let's see. What is this? Uh, I think I have slides that go through the. It's sort of a repeat of what I said verbally. Um, we probably don't need to go through this. Yeah, you know, I, I like to make a, a cautionary note about this. Um, the columns paper, that's what this paper is, introduced two big ideas. One big idea is that each column is able to learn a sensory motor model of, of its input, a complete model. So every column is learning complete models. And to do so, it needs to have a reference frame. That was a big idea. The other second big idea uh, is the voting between columns. All the other details in the paper, some are true or some are not true. Um, some are, there's a lot of things the paper didn't explain at all. 
It didn't explain how the orientation of the sensor is integrated. It didn't explain how the column knows how things are moving. It didn't explain how the representation of location is occurring. It, and we now, it didn't explain what we call a compositional object, which is objects are composed of other objects. And, um, and so the model that we're showing here, where you just match a sensation with, uh, with a location, that's not, it's too simple. It, it's just not that simple. And, and we knew some of these, we knew a lot of these things. So I, I think what you just in our need discussion, to... we talked about a lot of these issues. Yeah, and we even yeah. proposed, I think, grid cells in that. Yeah, paper. we did. We did. But we, even then, we didn't understand. So the point yeah. is that the two big things that are really, really big ideas that are going to stay true are that there are that columns have reference frames and they build structured models through sensory motor integration. Um, and they're going to use grid cells for reference frames for that. We hinted that in the discussion. Uh, and the other one is the voting and the voting mechanism. And lots of the other details are, are simplified or some are a little bit wrong. And we knew a lot of this at the time. We decided to publish a paper anyway, because those two big ideas are really big ideas and they're worth mentioning. Um, um, but I don't think you should, the, the mechanism that Super I talked about occurring in a single layer, this, the, the, this mechanism for both the voting and the mechanism for like forming representations of input in different contexts, that's still true. Um, but many of the, the details, you know, like we just don't, we, I guess the example was, we don't show how orientation is represented here at all. And we don't show how um, uh, object, uh, how we learn object behaviors or object composition. So uh, that's one, it's one that we realize that this is just, the, there's a lot of other details, some of which came out in the frameworks paper, some of which we still haven't published, some of which we still don't know. Um, but these two big ideas are really big ideas, so they were worth publishing. Yeah. I think this uh, this slide has kind of the exact rules that in our simulation, which again Jeff has mentioned, that's not. There's a lot more. Uh, that's, there's a lot of stuff that's not explained, but there's this is in the simulations what we actually implemented. Um, including the learning rules. So it's, as you can see, it's super simple. It can be stated. It's, I, I kind of stated it all verbally, so I don't know if it's need to go through it or not, but um, we had a bunch of these simulation results in there. Um, this is looking at the set of cells that are active in the, op, in the pooling layer, in the object layer. Um, so on the left here, it's, it shows, you know, let's say for 10 different objects, what is the SDR corresponding to each of these 10 objects? So I think we had roughly 4,000 cells in the object layer. And so for object number one, these are the cells that would be active. And for object two, it'd be, you know, this column of cells active. So there's a very sparse subset of cells that's active for each um, object. I think we had 40 out of 4,000 active. So it's like 1%. Um, very, very sparse. And then if you look at panel B here, this shows the convergence of those of that layer as a function of the number of sensations. And um, here, this is for column one. You can see with the first sensation, you get a dense set of cells that become active. This graph is a little bit misleading because we had to make these bars somewhat thick. The actual sparsity is it's still very sparse, although you can't tell here. But on the first sensation, you get a union of a bunch of different objects that are consistent with that, that become active. And then as you get subsequent sensations, the set of cells that are active in the object layer are winnowed down. And then this red rectangle here shows the point at which it recognized um, uh, it uniquely. So the set of cells that are active here correspond to the target object, which I think it was basically object zero here. So you can see it in this case, it took what 10, 12 sensations to uh, settle in. If you look at panel C, we uh, look at three different cortical columns. And here you can see that uh, basically in about three touches or four touches, there's all the cortical columns have uniquely identified that object. Okay. So here, I think we, in many cases, it'll just happen with one sensation. Uh, when you have multiple cortical columns, we just chose one where there's a lot of ambiguity just to kind of illustrate the concept. Yeah. 
This is artificial data, if I recall. We it's all artificial data. Yeah, oh, everything okay. in this paper is artificial data. Um, so this shows, um, at, you know, as you increase the number of objects in the training set, uh, you get more and more ambiguity. And therefore the number of touches you need to uniquely identify something will increase over time. Um, and then the other factor is you can have, if you have more and more unique features in your cortical column, it's gonna get, it's gonna be quicker and quicker. So if you look vertically here, if you only had five unique features that are available, it would take you longer. Whereas if you had 30 unique features, um, you can sort of understand that each feature is going to really narrow things down a lot more. So when you have a fixed number of objects, let's say 40, and you have 30 unique features, you'll barely take more than one touch to recognize it. Whereas it might take you three touches with a cortical column. So there's two different factors here, like how many objects have you learned in the cortical column and how unique the features are. Um, and this shows um, the number of touches you need on average uh, as you increase the number of cortical columns that are that are voting. And in all cases, as you increase the number of cortical columns, the number of average number of touches you need rapidly goes down. Um, and again, you know, as you have more and more unique features, um, it's, it's very fast. So if you have 30 unique features and three cortical columns, you basically always get it in one touch. Um, we looked at the capacity of, I think I'll just skip over some of this stuff. Um, maybe I'll, I'll show this one. We talked a little bit about some of the neurons that have long range lateral connections. Here's, there's many papers that, that talk about it. Here's one particular image that I really liked uh, that's showing this particular cell. This is looking from the top down, this, uh, this particular cell and the connections it makes locally. So this is essentially within one cortical column, and you can see that it's making connections further and further away to uh, different cortical columns. There's more subtlety here, which I, I won't get to. On this Actually, you know, it's, it's worth pointing out, there's a general rule in your cortical anatomy. Uh, and the general rule goes as following. Every pyramidal cell, and we're talking about pyramidal cells here, um, it has an axon, and the axon splits, and it spreads laterally or elsewhere within its column. So it makes local connections. That would be represented here probably by the red thing. But as a general rule, every, every pyramidal cell also, its axon leaves the column. It goes down into the white matter. This I think is a universal rule. I, I don't know if there's any exceptions to this. You mean for, for layer two, three? No, all, all pyramidal cells. Not stellate cells, but all pyramidal cells. I believe it's true for every pyramidal cell. Um, I, I, I think that's why they're, um, this is why, you know, when they talk about inhibitory cells, they sometimes distinguish them between interneurons. Yeah. Interneurons are basically any cell that doesn't send its axon elsewhere, whether it's inhibitory, excitatory, most of them are, are inhibitory. Uh, but like spiny cell cells don't send their axon out of the cortex, therefore they're considered interneurons technically. So, but if it's a pyramidal cell, I believe every pyramidal cell sends its axon into the white matter someplace else. Now, it doesn't mean it's going elsewhere in the cortex. It could be going to subcortical or something like that. But I believe these all layer two, three cells, and I could try to check this, but I believe this is true, send, their, send an axon also into the white matter, which will go someplace else in the cortex. And you're not gonna see that in this picture. It would, it would well, might... We have this cortical, I think that's this, uh, this cortical cortical connection here, potentially. Yeah, yes, right. But this picture you're showing with the red dots, these are- No, no that shows, just shows the- Yeah, this is within, you see, this is all, you can see the little uh, scale bar there, one millimeter. So this is all within like, you know, 10 millimeters or seven millimeters. And that, that's kind of the, uh, that's generally considered the extent, maybe eight millimeters, the extent of what a, what a local axon will do. Um, but it doesn't mean it's not connecting much further away. It is almost certainly connecting much further away in the cortex. Uh, it just won't be very, very sparse. It, it, you're just not going to You might see one teeny little red dot someplace else and another teeny little dot someplace else. Um, or a bunch of teeny dots someplace, you know. 
Just, I'm just yeah. pointing that out. Yeah, that's what the cortical cortical connections are. Yeah. They're labeled on. Um, yeah, so maybe one last slide. Um, so the whole idea, you know, the two, two big ideas that Jeff mentioned um, really change how you think about hierarchy, how you could think about hierarchy. And we're still trying to figure all this out, but I'll, um, I'll mention, uh, you know, one aspect of it. And this is sort of, again, the core to the whole thousand brains theory idea. So if you look at hierarchy in the traditional viewpoint, you have some sensory input coming in from the retina. You um, have some simple features that are detected, let's say in V1 in the first layer, more complex features in V2 and so on. And then somewhere up at the top, you have an object, the objects are actually recognized. Um, but if you look at the anatomy, the anatomy is com not consistent with this at all. I mean, it's, there are way, way more connections um, you know, all these lateral connections and feedback connections and so on, way more connections than you need for just a simple hierarchy. So something like 40% uh, of all possible corticocortical connections actually exist between regions. And this was um, documented in, I think, by Fellman and Van Nessen in 91. Um, so the connectivity is extremely non-hierarchical. And they, they know, I, I believe that number is much higher now because they, they found these connections that they, they didn't even imagine looking for. Um, yeah. Like in this picture here, the Feldman Van Nessen diagram, the right is the visual areas and the left is the somatosensory areas. And you see, they don't show any connections between the lower regions. Um, but we now, I, they've now found these connections that go from like, primary visual region, the primary sensor. You mean like from here to there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're, they're not a lot, but they're there, which make absolutely zero sense in the classic view. Like what would a, you know, how could a, um, a, a, a line orientation in one part of your visual field affect, have anything to tell you about um, a particular sensation in your, off of one finger? You know, it, it doesn't make any sense um, in the classic view. But anyway, I might point out this 40% number is much higher now um, because they have new ways of discovering these things. Yeah. Huh. And of course, as we know, this, this figure completely ignores the whole thalamic pathway. Yeah, which, which is yeah, a whole different yeah. conversation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, no, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so just a uh, question. Yeah, go so just to be clear, that forty percent figure is talking about connections between brain regions. It has nothing to do Correct. with what the sparsity of the connections exactly the, yeah. the individual yeah. connections are. Okay, all right. Exactly. Yeah, but the, it, sparsity, but it, the actual sparsity is very high when you look at neuron to neuron. But this is but everything region it, otherwise region. is connected region to region. Okay. Yeah, right. but it, it's very biased by the techniques that were technically available at the time they did this, and also where they looked. You know. They, they, there was no like magic, you know, camera that says, show me all the regions. They, they had to do this very painstakingly back then where they would inject a dye into one set of the region and then see if that thing showed up in another set of regions. And it was very, very, so it, it, was, a, it was a very biased sample in many ways, both by the technology available to the researchers and by what they were expecting to see. Well, I would thought with the rabies uh, uh, tracing technique, they would have been able to discover wherever they went, right? No, it's very difficult. It, it's, it's really challenging. I don't believe that's true, Kevin. I, I could be wrong, but I don't think that's true. Hmm. Uh, you, have to, you have to, you know, go down and, and you know, inject the dye. You have to make sure what layers are you injecting it into. Um, then you have to figure out, you know, how far does it, many of these dyes, I don't know the rabies thing, but many of them don't go very far. They, they, they get limited. And then you have to then carefully look everywhere else in the cortex. No, they kind of look where they expect to see it. Um, so it's, it's the techniques, especially back then, even today are really, really difficult. They're not well, easy. Tony Zador's, actually Tony Zador's technique might be um, one that has a lot of promise for figuring this out. Yeah, stuff yeah. Out very, very yeah. well. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's another uh, discussion. Yeah, was, yeah. That's a really fascinating uh, technique. Yeah. Anyway, the techniques for, met, for doing determinants are very difficult, very limited. In fact, when Feldman and Vanessa did this paper, they had to, collect, they had to combine results from different experimental techniques, different ways that people did this. That was one of their challenges because the different techniques show different types of connections or, or have different limitations. And so they admit in their paper, like, well, 
you know, we're combining them, but maybe that's not the right thing to do because the, each one has its biases. Um, each one will show some connections and not others. Uh, so, but this is the best I could do in 1991. Are all and the connections finally, here uh, between- Sorry, go ahead. Layer, are all the connections here uh, between layer two, three in these regions or no, is it no. spread out among the different layers? Uh, uh, it's, <laughs> it varies again on the techniques. No, no, they did a very specific, in this paper, it was from layer two, three to layer four of the next region. Are you they sure? Looked at a very, I'm pretty sure I should look back at the paper, but they were, I think they made a point of um, saying this is this is particularly the pathway they're looking because that to them, that is the feed forward pathway, layer four to layer two, three to layer four. Oh, uh, um, maybe I'm wrong about and, that. And so they were looking specifically at that pathway, I think. I, I need to go back and check the paper. Well, there's it's very well known today that um, there are two output layers of the cortex the two layers of cortex that project long distances. Uh, one is two, three, which is you say, is that two layers? Good question. Um, but cells in layers two, three will project long distances. And, and there's two cell types in layer five, and one of them projects long distances. So if you look at the cells in layer six and layer four, and you know, in, in other places, part, some parts of layer two, three, they don't do that. Um, so, um, so, I'm not sure what, what they were restricting themselves to in this case. They probably didn't look at the layer five stage. I don't know. Oh, I, I, yeah, I'm almost 100% sure they didn't. But that rule that there's two layers of cells, two types, upper layers and lower layers spread is, is very well known. Uh, can I make yeah. a, a side point about that right now? Um, I'm interrupting your hierarchy thing here. No, that's fine. Um, we talked about object identity, right? We're recognizing objects. And, and we know that this is happening because you, you, when I look at my coffee cup, it's stable, even though my eyes are moving. So I perceive the object identity. I don't perceive the movement of my eyes necessarily, unless I attend to it. Um, and, and so we know that what we're perceiving is this voting. However, we're not just voting on the object identity. We're also voting on the object's orientation and location relative to my body. I don't just see, oh, I'm seeing a coffee cup. I see the coffee cup at a particular location at a particular orientation. And so that's stable too. And so that also has to be voted on. We haven't talked about this much, but um, the voting is more than just uh, object identity. It's also the objects posed to the body. Um, and uh, we've not really incorporated that in our theories yet, but, but so there's more than one thing being voted on here. And we don't really understand that too well yet. Um, we talked about it a bunch, but um, I just want to point that out that you can you can know what's being voted on by what you are able to perceive consciously and and talk about <laughs> because you don't get to say what's going on in most of what's going on in the column. Uh, that's not that's not available to the other parts of the brain, but the part that is available to your memory and to, to and to your conscious what you can talk about um, is the uh, that that has to be voted on because it's stable. So it's more than just object ID. Yeah, I've been thinking of this voting process not as a voting algorithm per se, but just um, kind of a procedure that is going on in the brain at all times, and it's amenable to voting and disambiguating between objects. Is that a useful way to think about this? I, I don't think it's. I think it's. I, I'm not sure I understood it. Ben, are you, are you saying it's not always used? Uh, no, I'm just saying. It's happening all the time, and in yes. the specific examples that we use, you know, to disambiguate object, objects, when you reach your hand into a black box, then you know, it really looks like voting. But really, it's it's happening all the time. Well, it is voting, and it's happening all the time. So I'm not sure the distinction between that is. Um, if you're making a distinction between those two, I'm going to stick with just the clarification that it's happening all the time. I'll yes. sort that out on my end until it, it is constant. <laughs> it is it is just nonstop. It's not a separate process. Yeah, I, I would also have a question to this this term. So the term of voting kind of always threw me off a little bit. So um, am I right that the lateral connections can also be learned and the connections can be strengthened or weakened over time? Yeah, they have to. Yes. Yeah, okay. everything's learned, yeah. You have to do that. Well, 
Yeah, then, and these, uh, we have the learning rules uh, here, which if you want, we can go through. So that, that means that not every vote is equal, basically. So it's not really a democratic system where every column puts in one vote and then it's counted or something. It's more like how opinions spread on social media. Some sources are more credible and reach more people. And uh, concerning different types of questions, if I may make that metaphor. Well, like I, think, I think the difference between this is that you can try to, in this case, the system settles on a single answer. It, it, it's, it's never happened, you know, that you don't find the brain, the, you know, like, you know, liberals and conservatives or something like that, you know, it's like, it, it, they're all gonna, it, it's gonna, it's gonna do it. It's not happy not having a single answer. So it's gonna keep yeah, going. The left to, and the right actually agree. <laughs> yeah, sorry, left and right, yeah. <laughs> okay. um, so uh, it's, it's, so it's not like, oh, this is gonna win out because it's got more votes. Even a small part of the brain that is inconsistent so imagine I'm looking at a coffee cup and I got, I got two eyes on it. So I got thousands and thousands of col columns modeling this coffee cup and they're all agreeing it's a coffee cup. And then I'm holding the coffee cup in two hands. And so I have, I have hundreds of patches of skin that are touching the coffee cup at the same time. And they're all in agreement. They're all saying, yeah, this is the same thing. Um, but now if one small part, one teeny part of my visual field or one small part of my skin feels something that's inconsistent, you know, like that shouldn't be there. You don't, it doesn't get, you, you notice it. It's like even a single incorrect vote can say, uh-uh, what you're telling me, it's inconsistent with what I'm sensing, something is wrong here. And the whole system gets flipped around. And it's, it's not like a, it's, it's not like, oh, majority wins. It's like, everybody's got to agree. And if one person disagrees, one person has solid evidence that this is not what they're sensing. There's a, a funny sensation on my, one, my index finger. Um, then, then the whole system attends to that and we say, okay, what's wrong here? Um, something's inconsistent, we have to figure it out. And what we'll do, what you'll do is you'll then visually attend and tactfully attend to that one spot on the cup that was not right. And you say, oh, there's a funny little hole here, or it's got a crack, or you know, it, this part of the cup is made of liquid. I don't understand that. Um, so it's not a majority rule. It's it's like you know, unanimous. Okay. Yeah. It, could you look at it as kind of like also a bit like maybe a scientific uh, system where there are experts uh, for some types of questions. Um, so this column has a very strong connection to that one. And uh, because uh, when this column votes that this is a coffee cup, it's usually right. And this is like the expert. I, I don't think so. I think there'll be columns that, the columns that, that have nothing to say about it don't, don't, don't get to influence the result. So obviously I'm just looking at the coffee cup. I'm not touching it. Then the visual columns are in control. Or if the only differentiation between two different objects is color, then obviously the tactile inputs can't really differentiate between those. Um, similarly, if the only two differences between two objects is maybe temperature or, or um, uh, some sort of texture on the surface, then maybe the visual cortex can't, can't resolve that. So I, I think it's the way to more look at it, it's not like some are better or more trustworthy. I think it's just, they all have different abilities and, but everyone has to agree based on their abilities. Um, but there's no more expert than someone else. Of course, if, if a column had never learned something at all, um, if it just doesn't even know what, if, if you've never, if you've, if you've touched something but never seen it, then the visual cortex wouldn't have models of that and they couldn't participate. Okay. Yeah, to, to me, uh, already the lower level idea of having the lateral connections between columns makes a lot of sense and is very clear to me, but then the high level metaphor of voting kind of confused me a little bit and made me think that I maybe got that wrong. Of Well, I don't know, it's an interesting question yeah. if it's the right word voting, we, we use that. I don't know if there's a better there, word. There are a lot of other terms that you could use and some people have, have used like, uh, you know, you can frame it in terms of prediction. You know, the different columns are predicting what the object would be and the, and the columns that have the most <laughs> predictions if you I guess that's voting but <laughs> you know it's 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 kind of like a predictive signal you know we, we you know you're getting predictions from neighboring columns so it's a type of predictive coding if you 
if you want to think of it yeah, that but way. I, I, I think the, I, I think, again, it's, I'm not I think sure the, thing we have, the thing we have to avoid is like, like, oh, majority wins. That's, that's not right. It's not the majority wins. It's everyone has to agree. Even if I don't have a lot to say about it, maybe I have just a limited ability to predict, you know, to know what this object is, but it has to at least be consistent with what my models of the world are. So I think the idea that it's not like a majority, that's the thing I'm trying to get over. It's, it's, yeah. uh, Alex's suggestion of uh, distributed consensus. Yeah. Yeah. You know, another example, one I use in the book is, you know, the bistable images or bistable perceptions where you can have like, you know, the, the example was the, you know, the face, the two faces versus the vase. And um, there you have, you know, the, all the columns could be consistent with either interpretation, all the visual columns, you know, it could be the one. And so, but you don't maintain both of those thoughts in your head at the same time. It's very, you can't perceive that image as both faces and vase at the same time. It just, it's gotta be one or the other. And it can bounce back and forth every few seconds, but there is no like, hey, you know, we're, we're not consistent here. So we'll just keep two, two things going at once. Nope, everyone's gonna agree or not agree. And if there was a single feature that differentiated between the vases and the faces, then you wouldn't see the other one. It would just be, you're done. You know, we know what it is. So like when you have in proofs, you, know, you have the notion of uh, um, uh, uh, it just went out of my head. Um, uh, su necessary and sufficient. In this case, it needs to be uh, consensus and consistent. So both of those have to kind of be operating. So I, I do like the, the word consensus because everyone has to agree. And as Jeff said, if one person demurs, then they can't come to a uh, uh, decision as to what it is. Uh, so the uh, one piece of inconsistency d disrupts the consensus. Yeah. Okay, let me try and finish up this hierarchy. <laughs> My fault, uh, sorry. No, it's, it's okay. Um, but. So there are a lot of these non-hierarchical connections. And of course, that's completely consistent with the whole uh, thousand brains theory and the voting mechanisms that we discussed. And so, you know, the idea here is that you don't have a uh, feed forward hierarchy where objects are recognized only at the top. Instead, you have cortical columns at every level that are trying to recognize, that can model complete objects and can are trying to recognize the object that it's sensing. And then all of these cortical columns are voting in this sort of massively distributed way. Um, and then trying to achieve, figure out exactly what the object is that you're sensing. And these, these lateral connections um, or you know, these non-hierarchical connections in large part are involved in this voting process. And this takes into account multi, multiple modalities very, very easily. As long as they're modeling the same objects, it doesn't matter whether it's somatosensory or visual, they can all uh, because they can all have stable representations of objects, they can easily uh, vote to, on what the object is. And so, uh, you know, think about like a, a lemon versus a lime. You know, if you're touching it, you may not be able to tell the difference, um, but your eyes can tell you what the color is. And so you can, you know, if your eyes are open, you can instantly decide what, what, what the object is. Yeah. So um, uh, I, I can see the two modalities and I can see the, the cross connections, what motivates that you need a hierarchy at this point at all? Well, that's a great question. And uh, we don't know, but we, here's the things we do know. I mean, there's a lot of things, we don't really understand hierarchy very well. First of all, in the cortex, there still is, there still are hierarchical connections. So those, the, the, the gray arrows there are connections from a region of cortex through the thalamus to the next region of the cortex. And they are one directional and they do look hierarchical in the sense that they project from one region to the next region to the next region. Um, and then, um, but let's take like the visual regions. There's like we show three visual regions here. Well, in the actual brain, V1, V2, and V3, they're connected in a hierarchical scheme like this. But all those regions also get direct input from the, from the, from the retina directly. So the retina projects directly to V1 and it projects you know, well, through the thalamus, it projects to V2. It projects to V3. So it's not like it's just going in, this picture shows it just going into the first region. So all three regions there um, are actually getting direct 
input from, uh, from the retina. And so one hypothesis we have is that the, the, the columns in the higher regions um, are getting input from a broader range, broader area of the retina. So they would be able to recognize objects that are larger on the retina e easier. And the, the one like in B1 would be able to recognize objects that are smaller. It would be like saying, imagine I have an image in front of you and I'm asking you to look at the image through a straw. Um, if it's a very skinny straw and it's a big image, it will be hard for you to recognize the big image. It'll just be hard for you to integrate over time the, the sensations you need to do this. Um, and, but if I look, let you look through that image with a big straw, you'd be able to do it. Similarly, if I had a very, very small thing I was looking at, like a tenuous letter you could write. Well, the, looking at it through the narrow straw would work very well. But if I look at it through a big straw, assuming I have the same resolution for straw, meaning I would now be, would be very fuzzy, um, I wouldn't be able to recognize it. So one hypothesis we put out is that, you know, at least in the first several regions of the visual system, they're, they're looking at the world through different scales and that makes it so the, so the sensory motor integration can work. Um, but they still have this hierarchical connection. Uh, one possibility of the hierarchical connection is that, um, that uh, region V1 can project to V2. Not only, you know, not only does V2 get input directly from the retina, but it can also get process data from V1. So V1 can be saying, you know, I think we're looking at a coffee cup. That's your input to your, your region. Uh, another thing is that these connections that go through the thalamus look like motor connections. And so they may be just passing motor information between regions, which is harder to describe. Um, so I guess I'm saying, Kevin, there's a lot we don't understand about this. Um, and we need to, um, uh, it's just, there's a lot we just don't understand about it yet. But I feel pretty confident that if we, that each column is building models and therefore as shown in this diagram, different, uh, one of the reasons why you have different models is, at different levels is that is scale issue. But that I think is pretty, comp pretty confident about, but it may not be the only reason, it probably isn't. I have a quiz question for people to think about or a thought question. If you think about the pure feed forward hierarchy, which is this kind of left image here, what percentage is, uh, percent of the synapses in the neocortex actually correspond to this particular model. I mean, clearly there's a hierarchy embedded in here in the sense that there's always a hierarchy in a complete graph. So it's almost thing. But if you look at just this model and what they propose as being the main kind of feed forward pathway, this hierarchical pathway, what percentage of synapses in the neocortex are actually part of this? Does anyone have a guess? Huh? 10%. Okay, Kevin says 10%. And uh, why do you say that? Uh, my understanding was, uh, well, okay, that's, that's, I, I was running off the fact that uh, there was suggest at one point that there's 10 times as many uh, connections going the reverse direction as in the feed forward connection, but that eliminates totally the aspects of, of hierarchy and, and, uh, and lateral connections. Well, so yeah, lateral connection. So I, you know, I thought what you were going with this is maybe these are the proximal connections to the network neuron, and we said, okay, that might be like five percent or something, five or ten percent. So that's. Um, okay. Does anyone have uh, any other guesses? You can't skip connections, like to the second to next layer. Um, you could count that, sure. Um, I guess if it's pure feet, I mean, it's not in this simple pure hierarchy, but um, There's you know, a many deep learning models have a skip connection in the hierarchy as well. So you could, you could count that, yeah. There's a hint that won't make much of a difference. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's why I let it go. <laughs> so you say most connections are not hierarchical, so it has to be below 50%. But first of all, okay. sympathize is saying all synapses in the cortex, all not, synapses just, in the neocortex. Not, just, not just the synapses between regions. You're saying all synapses. Right? All synapses. Look at the full cortical column. Remember, there's, you know, each region here has full sets of cortical columns. For example, in a convolutional neural network, you ask what percentage of the connections are, you know, hierarchical, like go from one layer to the next layer to the next layer. And they are the number. It's 100%. Of 
hundred percent. Okay, so we're contrasting. <laughs> that is the whole bottle. <laughs> yeah, because they don't have no unless it's you know unless it's some sort of recurrent connections in the layer. Yeah. they they don't have those connections, and so he's putting a a, a pretty big bar here or a, a low bar to be. Yeah. Um, so let, let me point out some facts. So as we've discussed before, a very small percentage of the synapses are actually proximal. So it's you know these are definitely proximal connections that are going up the hierarchy here. So I think we talked about two to five percent of a pyramidal neuron's connections are proximal. Okay, we're going to so be below the, that. <laughs> you're going to be below that, but uh, you know, so it's bounded by two to five percent. So it's going to be less than five percent of the connections. So that's a hint. <laughs> Start thinking that way. All right. Okay, and so the, this this is I, I could just give you. It's a trick. Was, it's a trick question. It's a well, it's it's important question I think actually. Yeah, yeah. But it, when you think about a cortical column and you look at the pure feed forward hi hierarchy, the way people think about it, it's again input to layer four, layer two, three, and then back up to the next level. And so you're only looking at a couple of the layers. So there's many layers of cells that are completely unaccounted for here. So. You know, it may be that on, this only accounts for, I don't know, 20 or 30% of the neurons in the, in the cortical column. And then even within those neurons, it's only about two to 5% of the connections. So I think it's dramatically less than 1% of the connections in the neocortex are explained by this feed forward connection. What this means is that there are a hundred times more synapses than it's explained here. And so the feed forward hierarchy explains 1% or less of the neocortex. And why do people think this is the way the neocortex works? It just baffles me. Uh, well, they, they just, they're they, ignoring 99% of what's going on I, in the neocortex. I, well, it's because the basic idea is that people didn't know what a cortical column does. And so they ascribe, ascribe very simple ideas to it. It's like feature yeah. extraction. But I don't um, think people even think of this uh, percentage this way because there are a lot of respectable neuroscientists that say the feed forward, is, this is the way information is processed in the, in the neocortex, but they're ignoring, that's only one hundredth of the story um, in some sense. Anyway, it's just a thought fun thought exercise. Um, I was thinking about how to implement this uh, idea in a machine learning system and- yeah. It kind of led me to a similar idea here, which is like, you're kind of saying that the neurons in layer four, uh, that's where the model is represented. Um, and those are receiving sensory and location input. So originally I was thinking, okay, you have to have some like feed forward stuff to compute features so that those neurons in layer four have feature representations. But now I'm thinking maybe even those connections or um, those processing steps are not necessary because the neurons from layer two and three are also feeding back down to them and they're also receiving information from other columns. So is it right to think of the neurons no, that are receiving no. sensory input as having indirect information? No, not really. Higher order stuff? Not okay. really. Again, you have, so it's really complicated, but the general thought is you have to keep track of proximal synapses versus distal synapses. Right, so when we say like, oh, I'm getting feed, you know, it does does V1 get feedback from V2? Absolutely, but is that a driver? Meaning, does it actually make the cells in V1 fire? Like, if I give you a sensory input from the retina to V1, it makes the cells fire in V1, and it's and um, and one of the some of the cells are in layer four. But if I have a feedback projection, it typically wouldn't go to the proximal synapses. It typically would go to the distal synapses and therefore it doesn't drive those cells. It doesn't make, you can't make, V2 can't make V1 fire, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so it doesn't contribute to the receptive field. Yeah, well, yeah, I wouldn't say that because it depends how you define receptive field, Actually, right? Yeah, you know, right. if you have a very simple receptive field, no, it won't. If it's a very complex receptive field, sure. I mean, these, these, feed, these signals, I mean, it impacts the output of the cell. It doesn't yeah. drive the output, but it, the context, you can think about it as context signals, it will impact which cells fire yeah. which so, cells. Yeah, right. So for example, here's what happens. Classically, receptive fields are defined, especially in vision research, which is most of this. They will, they will start off with an animal, they will stick a probe in V1, they'll show it some 
sinusoidal grading so that they can find out, oh, what is the receptive field of these cells? Oh, this cell responds to a lying edge at this angle, that kind of thing. But then when they actually record these cells in real life, in a live animal doing real things, they, can, they behave completely differently. <laughs> they seem to not care about that. They respond to other things or they, they only respond some of the time. Right? Right? And so what is the receptive field of that cell? Well, in the receptor, we would say that spell is, might be responding to a particular feature at a, and under various different contexts. And so there's, you know, but that cell could respond under different contexts. So in some sense, you could say that cell has many different receptive fields because all the different contexts in which it could be active. So, so anyway, it's just very confusing. And so if you stick with the classic definition of receptive field, then, then the feedback, they just say, oh, it must modify it somehow. But in reality, it just changes completely what the cell, how you interpret the cell. Um, and, and I don't know how to better describe it than that. Um, the language no, is that, not. That, that makes total sense to me. Um, I guess my question then would be, uh, maybe it's a big question, but how is it that neurons that are just getting sensory and uh, location information in layer four are computing things like you know edges of different orientation? Well, there's a separate question, how to, so here's the basic theory we had about this. If you look at a set of uh, cells that all, it's like a V1, the classic V1 experiment, and you see a set of cells that they all respond to an, an angle at 45 degrees, let's say. You'll see those cells lined up vertically. Uh, there'll be a, a set of cells that they find respond that respond to 45 degrees. And then you go over a little bit and a set of cells responding to 30 degrees. That kind of lines up, that difference lines up with mini columns. And so like, so you could say that all the cells in this, in this little section, some of the cells, not all of them, the, some, the cells that they're actually able to find responding, which is less than 50%, um, seem to have this preference. And then the next mini column over the different preference. And in this case, since there's no context, because they're giving a sinusoidal grading with animals anesthetized, then we expect to see all those cells respond to the same orientation. The way I think about that is that has to be learned it's not, it's not predetermined. And, um, and not only do all those cells have to learn to respond, we have to ask how could all those cells in the mini column actually learn to respond to the same thing? Because why would they respond to the same thing? They're competing with each other. And the best answer we have, it gets a little bit complicated, that there are um, these inhibitory cells called bipolar cells with, or that have very, very skinny, they're very, they're, the axons and dendrites are really skinny. They kind of fit within a mini column. And they also have this receptive field. So they can say, yes, I'm, uh, this cell is going to respond to an angle of 45 degrees, just like all the pyramidal cells or the, the other cells in the mini column. And what we think is going on is that the, the, this is a pretty um, guesswork. I'm not going to say it, but this is the only explanation I have so far, is that those, those inhibitory cells actually are the ones that learn the receptive field. They compete with each other, these, these bipolar cells. They then train the excitatory cells to, to, in their columns saying, hey, guys, we're all together on this. We're all going to learn 45 degrees because that's, that's what I've learned. Um, and, and so that has to be learned. Uh, and if you change the statistics of the data, they'll form different representations. On that front, I think we should uh, stop now because we have our other okay. meeting coming.